thank you for the opportunity to present this work. Um, so uh, we've uh, uniquely actually identified mutations in this disease that had never been reported, particularly in the peritoneal cavity. So I'm pretty excited because this actually integrates well with the story that Dr. Alexander just talked about. Um, so as many of you know in the audience, this is an uncommon disease. You know, of the 3,000 cases of mesothelioma that we see, 500 of those cases actually occur in the peritoneal cavity. We all agree that this is a very lethal disease and without treatment, most people do not live for a year, quite, quite likely less than a year. Although we have made progress with systemic chemotherapy, uh, we still haven't found any magic bullets that are curing people and extending people's lives significantly. Um, and we know particularly for this disease, the pathway to cure is surgical cytoreduction and being able to optimally cytoreduce patients and treat them with intraperitoneal therapy. So very similar to what um, Dr. Alexander presented, classically these patients present with a large amount of ascites, which you can see over here. Um, and then you also can see this omental cake, which was demonstrated a little bit better in the case that Dr. Alexander presented. And then intraoperatively what we find is that the CAT scan typically doesn't reflect the magnitude of the disease in the peritoneal cavity. You can see this is very dramatic omental cake. In this particular case, there is a large amount of disseminated disease on the mesentery of the small bowel, which brings the blood supply. The serosal surfaces are spared. And in this particular case, there is thinner omental cake, and you know the small bowel and the mesentery are quite spared. So. Uh, one of the common themes that has been brought up is that our understanding of the biology of this disease is very minimal. We have a paucity of information out there right now. And there are a number of things, and this is true in every other cancer, that if we get a more detailed understanding of biologically what's going on, what are the, what are the molecular changes, what are the pathways that drive this disease, we'll be able to identify prognostic factors that we can share with patients in terms of how they're going to do with contemporary therapy. Also, it can help us select patients out better for surgeries so that we don't have to make the decisions on the OR table as to whether or not you're going to get major benefit or not. And also it can help us identify new targets that we need in this disease to improve outcome. Um, just as Dr. Alexander talked about, one of the common things that has been observed by several groups, both in the pleural space and in the peritoneal cavity, is that EGFR receptor expression is very common. Anywhere from 60 to 90 percent of the tumors that are reported in studies have fairly dense EGFR receptor expression. And we've seen this in other cancers, and one in particular is the lung cancer story where this association was found. It resulted in the, the identification of mutations, and ultimately what was thought to be negative information in terms of the role of therapies directed at the EGFR receptor were found out to be very good therapies for a subpopulation of people with lung cancer, and that story appears to exist in malignant peritoneal mesothelioma. So, not to inundate you, the audience, with science, when we talk about the EGFR pathway, what you see here, this is the cell, this is the cell surface membrane, the cytosol, and the nucleus. So here's uh, what the cell looks like. So there are these ligands that engage the receptors that sit on the surface, that's the EGFR receptor. When this ligand interacts, it causes these things to dimerize, and they can dimerize with themselves or with other family members and cause a number of events in the cytosol that leads to a cascade in the cell that turns on a number of pro-cancer activities, which is cellular proliferation, cellular growth, um, the inability of these cells to die, what we call anti-apoptosis, um, turns on genes that turn on blood supply as well, angiogenesis. So these are kind of the basic tenets of cancer growth. Um, and for the non-clinicians, what happens here, ligand comes down, the circulating out binds the receptor, you activate this, and that's what normally happens. Um, and again, there are other family members where this can occur, um, and you get a different set of signals that may register through the cell. The types of mutations that we detected are called missense mutations, which don't really change the the actual DNA numbers, but it changes the protein that's put in there, and it may change the activity, particularly down here on this activating kinase domain, and what ultimately we find out that happens, which we learned from the lung literature, is the percent activation in these cells increases from anywhere from 15 to 20 percent to almost 100 percent when these mutations occur, and the duration of the activity in the cell um, is much longer, which is important because it leads to more growth promotion. So normally in normal cells, it only lasts for 15 minutes, it gets shut down, and then these cells will turn over. But it almost turns these cells into constitutively active pathways, which is a cancer-promoting gene. 
So in our initial endeavors, we set out first to look at our tumor cells to determine that our EGFR receptor expression was commiserate with what's in the literature. We also set out to look for novel mutations in the catalytic tyrosine kinase domain. I mentioned missense mutations, but we also looked for a different type of mutation called amplification mutations. We found none, which is why I didn't talk about those. And then we wanted to correlate the presence of this mutation with outcome. And the best existing um, surrogate marker we have uh, in terms of outcome is our ability to achieve optimal resectability. When you can achieve optimal resectability in this disease, it tr translates into long-term survivorship. And then ultimately, survival uh, is the, the major endpoint. So when we talk about optimal resectability, there are a number of scoring scales out there. The one that we've adopted is the R score, which talks about five millimeter disease or less. Um, and actually, in mesothelioma, we talk about one centimeter or less disease as being kind of the cutoff where people get dramatic benefit out of this procedure. And what set the stage for this was a study out of the NCI, which Dr. Alexander was a large part of, um, is this study right here. So we know that when you look at patients and you break them down on ones that had less than one centimeter volume residual disease at the end of cytoreduction reduction compared to those that had greater than one centimeter, there is a distinct break in this curve. You achieve median survivorship approaching 65% here at five years in this category, and unfortunately this group of patients succumb at about 18 months of their disease. So in this study, as we all know, the, the numbers are limited. We were able to accrue 29 patients where we actually had tissue to go back and extract from their formalin uh, parenteral embedded samples, uh, extract the DNA, and then we probed for the activating kinase domain, the tyrosine kinase domain, four mutations in the EGFR receptor. And we did repeated PCR amplification. And once we detected it, we repeated it to confirm that it was actually a real event. We also did check adjacent normal tissue to show that this was a somatic event and not a germline mutation um, that may have occurred in the patient per se. So of those 29 patients that we actually had tumor specimen on, 25 had their treatment performed at our institution. And performing this procedure, cytoreduction reduction, with two either mitomycin or carboplatinum. And then we correlated the presence of the mutation with its ability or correlation with optimal resectability and survival outcome. So this is what we found. We actually found that the mutation rate was uh, fairly significant. We found a mutation rate of 34%. 10 out of the 29 patients had a mutation. One of those mutations, however, did not counter for any significant change in the protein, so it was not a potential activating mutation. So in terms of potential functional mutations identified, it was 31%, or nine of the patients actually had a mutation that could represent an activating mutation in this pathway. Um, for the scientists in the audience, you can see these are the DNA changes, uh, the associated uh, protein changes, and then the amino acid property changes that occurred. And what was very striking and what kind of told us that we were likely onto something was that this L858R mutation, which was the uh, groundbreaking mutation that was found in lung cancer and known to be an activating mutation, was isolated in two of our patients. So it made us very... Um, uh, confident that these were likely going to be activating mutations given this correlation, but we had to do the science to prove that. The other thing I show here is that we did do EGFR IHC expression, and what you can see is that there isn't much distinguishing value per se with the, the protein expression. So if you look at our wild type group and our mutant group, the high density level didn't really break down dramatically between the two. So now here's the raw data in terms of what we were able to achieve in the operating room in terms of um, resectability. And when you summarize this in terms of optimal resectability and suboptimal resectability, what was very striking when we were able to publish this data was that all the people who possessed an EGFR mutation were optimally resectable. In the wild type group, it was a coin flip. 50% were, 50% weren't. And this was statistically significant. So you already see a clustering that this group had a better outcome on the OR table. And preliminarily, as we were looking at this data, uh, what we found was in terms of disease recurrence, at this point when we published this paper, none of these patients had to succumb to their disease with 24 months of follow-up. They were all doing well. This group of patients had already experienced 44% of the patients dying from progressive disease. So we were beginning to see that this surrogate marker was translating into some survival benefit um, by identifying these mutations. 
Um, and again, on multivariate analysis, because the data was small and the data was short in terms of follow-up, the only thing that was predictive was R score at this point, or resectability. Now, I don't, I'm gonna talk later at the research meeting about the specific details, but we basically went back and assessed the functionalities of these mutations using the same exact model that was used in the lung cancer model. So uh, using an expression vector using, designed by Stratagen, we transfected the cos 7 cells, which are renal cells, um, and we grew them under the same conditions and then starved them and exposed them to ex exogenous EGF, which is the ligand that has to engage the receptor. And then we created these activity curves to determine if the mut mutations we identified were indeed activating mutations. And the translational component is, after we did this, we wanted to see if these mutations were responsive to existing tyrosine kinase inhibitor or lotinib as a potential therapy for these patients who possess these mutations uh, when and if they should develop a recurrence in their disease in the test tube. So just to give a little preview, here's one of our mutations that we identified. And what you can see here is wild type activity compared to, this is normal protein, um, unphosphorylated or, or unactivated. And you can see the wild type activity is pretty low. Here you just see dramatic activated protein in this mutant group, which is very much consistent with what was shown in the lung literature. And here's the activation curve raw data. You can see there is a much higher level of activity, and this activity level stays up out to almost 180 minutes before it dissipates. Now, when you expose this to small molecule allotinib in the test tube, there is very much a dose-dependent response to this therapy or response to this agent in these muta mutated receptors. And this was shown across the board with um, all of our patients. And you can see at um, fairly low levels in the cell, you're getting a very dramatic reduction. So recently, I've gone back and updated the outcomes. And what we've seen now is that there has been continued progression in the wild type group here. We've now reached median survivalship uh, in the wild type group, where the median survivorship for this group of patients that do not express this mutation is 14 months. 56% of the people at this point have succumbed to the disease. Um, in the patients that have the EGFR mutation, we have not reached median survivorship yet. At 24 months, um, only about 30% of the patients have died, and unfortunately, these patients developed recurrent disease and died before we had the lab data to actually test the benefit of erlotinib in these patients. Now, what's even more striking now is we went back and looked at how many people have experienced progressive disease, and in this wild type group, we've seen progressive, the pro Time to progression is 12 months for the group, and 72% of the patients at this point have developed progressive disease that don't express an EGFR mutation. And again, at 24 months and counting, um, this other 71% of the patients are continue to be disease-free at this point in time. And this is now approaching statistical significance with the progression-free survivorship. So what we can walk away from this data is that, one, EGFR expression is very common. We saw it at a rate of 86 um, percent. It does not give us all the clues and all the details of functionality in the cells. What does give us some um, evidence about functionality is the presence of these mutations that are upregulating up in these tumors, which occurs at 31 percent. 34 percent includes this one sense mutation. And we found seven novel missense mutations that had not otherwise been identified in cancer. Two of the mutations were the LA58R mutation previously presented or reported in the lung literature. Again, to re reiterate, the value of this is that at 24 months, 71% of the mutant positive patients are alive and disease free compared to this wild type group where at 14 months, only 44% of the patients are alive and only 28% of those patients are disease free. Um, and as expected, in kind of an internal control about our data, we know that our score was predictive of improved outcome across the board. So I think there's a big potential for the EGFR tyrosine kinase mutation to be a promising prognostic predictor in this disease in terms of selecting people for therapy. Um, it also may identify a group of people who will respond to tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy. What I should say is it's a relative prognostic predictor because we do expect these people to eventually relapse, but what they will potentially have is an opportunity to be treated with some form of EGFR pathway inhibition, which can either be small molecule or antibody. The case that Dr. Alexander presented was antibody, so there is potential to offer novel therapy for that subset. Um, 
We need to uh, look downstream at these mutations. Although they are the same on the surface, the events in the cells may be different, and that can be an active area of research and an active area of research that may identify new targets in this disease. And very importantly, as we've been talking about in this meeting, is this is a small study, so the real magnitude and incident needs to be evaluated on a larger scale in this disease. And I think there is an opportunity to expand this analysis, not just in the peritoneal cavity, but to the pleural cavity. Thank you.